human nature, according to Niccolo Machiavelli, Karl Marx, and Ayn Rand. There is no question more crucial to man than what is than the question, what is man? What kind of a being is he? What are his essential attributes? Indeed, man's nature determines that which his survival requires, and one's view of man symbolizes one's attitude toward life. What is open to us is whether we will discover our nature and whether we find the appropriate attitude. Niccolo Machiavelli and Karl Marx offer us two views of and attitudes toward man, which I will describe in their fundamentals. Novelist and philosopher Ayn Rand offers us a third view and attitude, as we all know, which I also share, and which I will contrast with that of Machiavelli and Marx. How one views human nature informs the entirety of one's philosophy. Now, Machiavelli thinks that liberty emerges only from a sly understanding of men's passions. He thus sees, he thus sees man as a quote-unquote wicked, passion-ridden power seeker, quote, ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, and deceiving, avoiders of danger, and eager to gain, end quote. Men are so immoral as to justify the prince's immorality. Thus, men should be, quote, either caressed or crushed, end quote according to the principle that, quote, it is much safer to be feared than loved, end quote. In this way, Machiavelli subordinates ethics to results. Hence, we recognize the adjective Machiavellian as meaning the ends justify the means. Of course, this runs counter to the conventional wisdom that morality reigns supreme. So, rejecting the idea that one must practice politics within the bounds of virtue, Machiavelli simply redefines virtue. No longer equated with righteousness, virtue becomes what he calls virtu, or the blend of ferocity and slyness. As Machiavelli explains, quote, we have not seen great things done in our time except by those who have been considered mean. The rest have failed, end quote. To it, a virtuosic prince must have, both, must have the qualities of both a lion and a fox. Indeed, crafty and deceitful princes have historically defeated the prince of integrity. For morality neither keeps nor wins principalities. Yet it is neither amoralism nor ruthlessness per se, but the attainment, the acquirement of power, which interests Machiavelli. Though ruler must often acquire power by amoral means, ruthlessness does in fact have its limits. A ruler must keep the necessary cruelties to a minimum and commit them in unison for the purely practical reason that he's going to lose power otherwise. Thus, Machiavelli intends the prince as a pragmatic guide, and so makes himself the father of realpolitik. Realpolitik is a politics of adaption to the existing state of affairs. In this fight, we can understand Machiavelli's reasoning. Not doctrinaire rhetoric, but realistic compromise lead to the, leads to the attainment of objectives. As Machiavelli explains, quote, one cannot have all the good qualities, nor always act in a praiseworthy fashion, for we do not live in an ideal world, end quote. Thus, the prince must master an ability to achieve what the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy calls, quote, unquote, effective truth. Important, therefore, is not what right, is not what is right, but what wins. Virtue and vice, rather than being, you know, rigidly absolute, are relative to success, and ethics are mere provisional tools in a constantly changing world. Now, albeit unscrupulous, a realpolitik regime is the best, Machiavelli tells us, to anyone is to benefit from government in the first place, even if the leaders are in fact Machiavellian, then that government must ensure the unity of its citizens at all costs. <coughs> that unity then depends on the continuity of the leadership for people see the government as a source of reassurance in their dealings. The government constantly changes leaders, then people no longer go about their daily lives with a sense of stability. After all, we sheep, according to Machiavelli, crave the status quo. Now, it's only human, Machiavelli might argue, in defense of human depravity. Yet, here, as with virtue, Machiavelli usurps the meaning of man. Exiling from the human race, the hero, the thinker, the producer, the inventor. He renders man into prey, the fool, the weakling, the coward. 
After all, the prince himself, a cat, the prince himself, a fraud, a fake, a hypocrite, must not suffer any challenges to his authority. Hence, Machiavelli reduces man to our lowest common denominator. He regards us as vulnerable rotters and struggles never to let us discover otherwise. But man is so much nobler and so much more important than that, and he deserves an according defense. In Hamlet's exquisite language, quote, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, end quote. Do you represent this beauty? Or, do you, or are you the corrupt Machiavellian chump? I say you represent this beauty, and so we should judge men by reference to the ideal world Machiavelli scorns. Political scientists should therefore propose their views of human nature by reference to our greatest exemplars, the Bill Gates, the Lance Armstrongs, the history and sociology professors, rather than by our John Doe's. It should focus in the immortal words of Aristotle, not on things as they are, but on things as they might be, and on things as they ought to be. 